Good morning. So today we're going to learn about generalized linear model. And let's start with a recap of what we have been seeing so far. And when we write a statistical models, we want to find a meaningful relationship between the response variable, which is usually denoted by Y, and one or more of our explanatory variables. Also, I am not sure if the, si what, if the slides are in the website yet, but they will be, they are? Yeah. Not. Okay, but they, okay, they might be incomplete, I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so we wanna find some meaningful relationship between our response variable and our explanatory variables, and we wanna do that either to, do, to make inferences about our system or to make, pre make predictions. And so far we have assumed that the response variable Y, it changes continuously and our error structure means that our errors are normally distributed around the mean, but this is not always the case. And the most extreme deviation of this normality on the distribution of Y is when your response variable can only assume zero or one values, which is the binary data. And we're gonna see some examples of that. And other deviations also include when you have categorical variables or count data. And for these cases and other situations that deviate from the assumptions of the linear models that we have been seeing so far, we can use what's called generalized linear models. So let's see what, what does it mean to break some of these assumptions of the linear models. So the first one is when your response variable doesn't have the support in the whole real line. So for instance, like binary data counts, only positive values. And then this would be an example of you have, when you have the survival of a given plant and you want to understand the survival in the next season according to herbivory levels in the previous season. So your response variable is either did the plant survive or did it die? So it's a zero or one. This is one type of uh, binary data that you could have. Another assumption is that the errors are normally distributed, and this is an example of a residual plot. And the residual plot, if you remember, this is when you plot the fitted values against the residuals of your, your regression. And you expect this to be normally distributed around zero. And in this pictorial example, we see that that's not the, po the, the case. We have like an outlier here. There's a negative relationship between the residuals and the fitted values. So this is breaking one of the assumptions of the linear model. Yes? This plot is uh, another example or? Another one, oh. yeah. It's not the same, the herbivory one. This is another one. And finally, uh, another assumption is that the variance and the mean scale uh, in the same way, but this also doesn't have to be the case. You can have a relationship between the variance and the mean, which just ma basically means that the variance scales somehow with the mean. And so this is another example just to show what this would look like. But we're gonna look at this more carefully. So to deal with this um, deviations, we can use generalized linear models. And in these models, we are assuming that our response variable will be modeled by a distribution that comes from the exponential family. The Gaussian distribution is a special case. So linear models are a special case of generalized linear models. But it can also take into account other distributions like gamma, binomial, Poisson distribution. And our ind independent variables or covariates or explanatory variables, they're all the same name for the same thing, which is our axis. They can be continuous, categorical, or a combination of both. There's no restriction in our independent variables here. And the important thing about the generalized linear models is that there's a link function. And this is what I want you guys to understand from this class is what is this link function, what's the role of the link function, and it, the idea is that this function is gonna linearize the relationship between our predicted and response variables. And the, as the parameters are also estimated through the least squares algorithm that we saw with Andrea and Paolo. And so when we're building our GLMs, we have three main steps. 
Okay, and yeah, we have like these three structures of the model, which I'm, I'm gonna write it here because it's important that we keep in mind these this names. So we have what's called the random component. And the random component is what we had, it's our response variable, it's the y. And we are assuming that it's, um, our response variable is independently drawn from any distribution of the exponential family, like I said. And it's gonna model the variation of the data around the mean, just like we have been seeing before. So this would be one of the examples using the Poisson distribution. So you have your variable X, it follows a Poisson distribution, and this distribution is given by this uh, parameter lambda. And then the way that we do lambda, the way that we were doing before, it was basically we were looking at the mean. So what we had before was that mu i was given by this. This was like the relationship, right? One. Now the, the relationship for this, um, for this distribution is gonna be something like this. And this is clearly not linear. And what I was saying before, the link function is what's gonna make this linear, but we're gonna see how, we're, how to deal with that. This is just one example. And then we have the systematic component. Which is, uh, which is our explanatory variables. We can have up to p explanatory variables. And they are combined linearly to form our linear predictor. And so we want to know how this mean response changes as these explanatory variables change. And again, we are considering that this, the relationship between them is also linear. And then we have the link function. which like I said, is gonna, is gonna specify how these two components are related in a linear way. Or connection. So let's see how this works. Like I was saying, the, your GLM is gonna consist of three bas basic steps. The first one is gonna be, you're gonna choose the distribution of your response variable, and you're gonna make this choice beforehand based on the available knowledge that you have from your system. So there's, um, there's usual choices when you have binary data, when you have count data, and we're gonna look at these choices, but it's, it's done beforehand, and it also depends on your question. And then you're gonna define the systematic part, which is how your explanatory variables are, are related to each other. And finally, you're gonna specify the relationship between the expected values of your response variable and uh, you're gonna define your link function. And then for each one of the distributions that you choose for your response variable, there's usually one link function that it's used. And this can depend on the field that you're in, but yeah, it's usually a matter of practice and what people have been doing in the field and what makes sense given the distribution that you chose. So let's start with binary data. This is the extreme departure from normality and your response value variable can only assume one or zero. These are yeses or no, yes or no answers, survive, deceive, presence, absence, 
what either you lost or won something. Yes. I don't know if you're going to get to it, but our, um, what's the word? Uh, proportion data, it's, a, it's like an extension of binary data, right? Yes. Are you going to get to it or no? I, yes, I think so. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> It dip oh, um, yeah, yeah. And what we can do is we can assume that our response variable follows a Bernoulli random variable, which can only assume the values of one and zero. And this is, this is what's gonna uh, provide the random component of our data. The Bernoulli distribution is a special case of the binomial distribution. And this is one way that we can express that. So in this case, we would be interested in estimating this parameter pi. And then because our variable can only assume the values of one and zero, this means that if I draw, if, yeah, if I, if I draw a number, or if I see a plant, is it alive or is it dead? It's gonna be like this yi. So if it's alive, this is a one, and then this is gonna be a zero, your probability of observing that specific data is gonna be half. So say, this is basically saying that the probability of observing a one is equal to pi, and the probability of observing a zero is one minus pi. And now what we want to do is we want to relate this parameter pi to the linear predictor choosing the link function. And the most popular choice in this case is to use a logit, logit function. And when we're dealing with binary data, like we were, we were saying before, this is what we call a logistic regression or a, bi a binomial regression. And so the logit function, the basic, yeah, the basic model then would be the binomial or logistic regression. This is what it looks like. And now this is the way that we've been looking at our model. So our variable y is distributed as a binomial, um, as a binomial variable. We have these two parameters. And then we want to, this is our uh, link function is this logit, which linearizes uh, our predictor variables. and. When y is some count variable, this n will be the number of trials that you have attempted. Or in our case, this n is equal to one. It's gonna be a vector of ones and zeros, but when you have this y one, is either did you observe a one or a zero? And now let's take a closer look to this uh, logit function. So this is what it looks like, and it can also be written like this, and this means that when we want to isolate and learn about our probability, our pi, this is what we're going to look at. But let's do step by step. How, how do we go from that logit to this? Because it was not clear for me. So we have this function. That is the function that it's going to connect our random and systematic components. And this is the parameter of our binomial distribution. And this can be written, this is this logit function, this is what it means. And then this is equal to what we want to estimate, which is this, like we have been doing before. And now, we want to isolate the effect of this so that we can get specific uh, probabilities associated with each of our ones and zeros. So we have a one and zero, we want to linearize this. So now what we do is we exponentiate both sides. Then we can isolate this guy. And this may basically, yeah, then.
Then we move this to the other side. We have Then we isolate the pi, and we have, this will be one plus this. So this is how we get here. And this can also be written in alternative way, it's just, our pi is one minus one over one plus. So this is when we have the logit logit link fun function for the logistic regression. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't understand if you have to know beforehand the link function. Like in this case, did you know for the binomial, but not binomial, it was going to be the logit? Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is usually, yeah, this, the logit is what we use usually in, in biology, but I know that in, in economy, they use another function for the, for the logistic regression. So you, you know beforehand how you can relate this, these parameters. So maybe it's worth if we do, for this case, what we have is our yi is, okay, so we have our n and we have our pi and Yes. <laughs> True. Yes. And I've, I've seen before, like, there are some, I don't know, some common link functions to use depending on what dis dis distribution you're using. But I, do you have to know, of course, you have to know the, the, the random component, mm -hmm. right? The response variable, the distribution of it. And does the link function vary depending on the explanatory variables as well? So in this example, it's like a binomial distribution for the response variable and a normal distribution for the explanatory variable, mm -hmm. right? So if I wanted to use, for example, a binomial for the response and I don't know, uh, any other distribution, would it still be a logistic for, for the explanatory variables? If you're in the world where your connect, where your explanatory variables and your systematic component follows that that uh, linear term that we were, if the parameters are a linear combination of your explanatory variables, then yes. Okay. And so when we, when we have this, what we can see is that if, the, if our systematic component, this is just one way of like looking what is happening with, this, with the shape of this curve. So when, when our systematic component is zero, the probability is gonna be one half. And then as this probability tends to one, this, uh, this will tend to, inf this term will tend to infinity, and when our probability tends to zero, this will tend to minus infinity. But let, let's take a look, let's see how this looks. So what we, we would do in R is that we would just draw our x, it, let's assume our x is a random variable. Now we wanna build the shape of that curve using the beta zero and beta one, and the way that they are related. So we sample a beta zero, we sample a beta one. Our linear predictor is how they are related, and our predicted PI is gonna, it, it's given by the, what we just derived over there. And so this is what it look, this is what it would look like. 
And so this is what we call the logistic curve. That's where it comes from. And the parameters, beta 0 and beta 1, they control the location of this uh, inflection point and how steep this curve is allowing us to model this binary response variable and giving us back a probability of observing this data, the data that we have. Maybe it's going to be more clear if we do an example. So the example that we're going to do is we're going to look at the data from the Titanic and we're going to look at the probability that people had for surviving the, the Titanic disaster. And the, we're going to model this according to the class and the gender of people. And we can start with a basic new model where we want to know what's the overall probability of surviving the Titanic given that you were just there, not considering any uh, gender or the class that the passengers were. So there's a library called Titanic in R. And when we're looking at this like overall probability, we're just modeling our intercept. And so we just want to know what's the expected survival of, uh, of our data. So to do that, we do the, the GLM. We regress it against one. This means that it's the intercept. The, the way that we do the kind of uh, syntax is very similar to the one in the linear model in the LM function. And then you put your data and then you say, which family are you, are you your, which family does your response variable follows? Here's, here's the binomial, which is the logistic, logistic regression. And then we can get the, the, the coefficients that it, they estimated. But this coefficient, that's what's important and that's why I wanted to spend some time in here. This is actually, the coefficient here is, is going to be, this is the estimate of our coefficient, the logit, not the pi itself. And so what we have here then is, imagine that from the, from Paolo's uh, class of like the maximum likelihood, what we have is like, what's our best estimate when you have this like mean probability of survival, it's just going to be the mean. If you don't consider anything else, the maximum likelihood is going to be the mean. So we can see what is the mean number of the proportion of people that survive, the mean number of survive. This is what we have. And then we can see the coefficient and then we can plug in the coefficient, this pi. We can plug in here because this is what it's been estimated. If we plug it here and here, then we get our probability. And when we're not considering anything else, we have this new model, it's only the intercept, these are the same things. Does that make sense? No? Okay. So you have this data of people that survived or didn't survive the Titanic. And now you want to know what's the expected proportion of people that survive. When you're looking, like your best estimate for that variable is the mean of that variable, if you're not considering anything else, right? So this is what we have here. We're just looking at the mean of the survivor. And then, and this is not, we, we didn't run, run anything here, right? This is just the mean of my data. And then here, what we did is we ran our GLM, our logistic regression, we got our coefficients, and this is what it gives us. This is the estimate of our parameter logit of pi. Now, because there's this nonlinear relationship, and we want to transform this information that we have on ones and zeros into a probability of survival, we need to plug in whatever was here in this so that we can get the probability pi. If that, and then when we do that, we're taking that coefficient that we estimated here, we put it here, we do just like what we did there, and this is the probability that we have, which matches the mean probability of surviving when we don't consider, it, consider anything. But now we do have information on gender. Now what happens if we add this information? So to add this information, we are now going to do the survived as a function of sex. And for this case, one of the sexes, they are the, the baseline reference for your model, like we did before. And so then we have this different estimates. So this would be like the overall baseline. And then you have that the probability of male surviving. So this is the female survivor. And this is how males are modified 
by the female survivor. Remember that we talked about this a while ago, how, how to interpret the, the estimates. So again, then what this looks like, now we don't have uh, an expectation like we did before for like the overall survival. But now what we have, we do again plug in the coefficients. Now that's why I did it that other way there. It's the same thing. And so the probability of survival for women, it's gonna be the one, the first coefficient, which is in the intercept. And so women had a 74% chance of surviving the Titanic. And while men, here we have to add the first and the second coefficients because the second is modified by the first one. So if you're a man, your chances of surviving the Titanic were 18%. But we also know that this was not the same according to your classes. So depending if you're in first class, second class, or third class, this was different. So how was it if we also include the class? So here we are then, what we do is we add, we add the information of class, again, binomial, and then here we have the estimates, and then this is, uh, this intercept would be a female in, uh, or a woman in the first class. And then if you're a man, this is how you modify it. And then, so to interpret that and see what the estimates look like, if you were a woman in first class, you had 90% chance of surviving. If you were a man in third class, and that means, so you add whatever it was to be like the, the baseline one, so you add the first coefficient, then you add the second one because you're a male, and then you add the modifying of being in the third class which is that the fourth coefficient. So if you're a man, your chances of surviving was less than 10%. How do you, I'm sorry, the interpret the women from other classes? Yeah. Like, well, male, I understood. Mm -hmm. I understood how to see like class and male sex, but from the estimates, where is female from other classes? Because it's, a big table. <laughs> Do you have a guess? No. <laughs> no? Yes. So you just add, you just add the intercept. So the intercept means it's a woman in first class. Then if you add the first coefficient and the third one, it means a woman in the third class. So the first two, the first one is like, you're a woman, and then if you're a man, you add the second coefficient. And then if you're a woman and you wanna know which class, you're adding this other classes here. Okay, thanks. So now suppose that your response variables are non-negative integers, for, for example, you're counting the number of eggs that a female has as a function of their age, their body size, or you could have the number of new cases of a disease emerging over time. In these cases, you would use uh, Poisson regression, and a possible model for this case is to think of the response variable as being sample from a Poisson distribution, and one of the assumptions of this distribution is that the mean and the variance are the same, and they're expressed as the, this parameter lambda. So what, what this looks like is, you have just like one parameter, so your response variable follows this uh, Poisson distribution. And because, because this lambda is, can be interpreted as a rate or as your count, this is constrained to be a positive number. And the typical way that we use the, the link function in this case is to use the log. And then with this, we are assuming that the log of the parameter lambda, it's going to depend linearly on your predictors. And what this would give us is that the expectation of y, or the way that we were building before, is going to be that, yeah, so we have that our yi follows a Poisson, and we have a single parameter, and then what we have is that the log of y will be the way that your predicted variables are related. And then, of course, you could have more, more
more variables. So this is what the full model would look like. And yeah, so the log is, the log just links and makes this relationship linear between the fitted values and the predictors. And then here again, if we are fitting, uh, if we're fitting a GLM and using the Poisson, then when we want to interpret the parameters, what we do is we exponentiate them to get your rate lambda i. This is what you would do. Yes? Okay. Uh, but the main feature of this Poisson distribution is that the mean and the variance, they are both uh, equal to lambda. And this is rarely what we see in biological data. We usually have that the variance, e the, this like, constraint of variance and, and um, mean being equal is like very hard. This is not really what we observe. And when you have this over dispersion, the variance is, this, this means that the variance of your data is much larger than what is assumed by this Poisson. So you need to choose a different model. One way to deal with this is what they call a generalized Poisson distribution, or you can do a negative binomial regression, which can be thought as when you have a Poisson with a scaled variance. So what the negative binomial regression would look like is that you would actually have, uh, instead of having the variance and the mean be the same, you would have this like scale parameter phi that scales your variance according to, to your mean. And this phi is what's controlling the dispersion of your data. And a, uh, if you have the, a value of phi that's greater than one, this, this would indicate that your data is over dispersed. And when you have this phi less than one, this is under dispersion. And the Poisson regression is usually appropriate when this phi is almost similar to one. And one way to investigate that in your data in case you're wondering, is my the, does my data ha have over or under dispersion? What you can do is test running a quasi Poisson model, this model will return you a dispersed parameter and then you can see whether or not you need to think about alternatives to your data, to modeling your data. So some other GLMs that we have uh, are like the Gaussian, like I said, which is the basic linear regression. You can have the gamma or inverse Gaussian, which is um, positive and continuous. You could have Poisson for count data, negative binomial also for count data, finding your dispersion parameters, or you can have binary and binomial responses with the number of successes, probabilities, proportions. There's also non-canonical GLMs that use the same general idea, and they are positive continuous, or log gamma for survival models, or you could have probit for binary models as well. And those are some further readings. And what I think we should do right now, because our tutorial is kind of long, <laughs> so maybe we could start doing it now. We could start doing it together if you guys want, because I'm not sure if it's up there. So we could run it together, or I could see if we can put it up so we can have a small break until we decide, because otherwise we can just do it. We can do it together as well. Because we're, so in this, in our lab, we're gonna explore, let's see. Yeah, it's a bit long, so what we're doing in this tutorial, we're feeding some other models, and we're gonna see how you can use the same data to fit different, um, different, you can use the same data and different assumptions, and then you can use two different pr probabilities depending on how you arrange your data, yes? 
it's not there, right? So maybe we can we can do it together. Let's do it together. Okay. Because okay, so this we're gonna fit a data from the admissions at UC Berkeley, looking whether or not there's a gender bias in this admission, and we're gonna do this using um, logistic regression and a Poisson regression, and then. We're gonna do the same thing using a Bayesian fitting, so I think it is a bit long, but we'll see. Okay, so let's just remember this few concepts. You have your, your yeah, this is better. Like I said, yeah, like I said before, we have the regression model, it has the assumption that the mean, the, mean, the mean response depends on your explanatory variables. It was like normally distributed. This is how we model the, the mean. But in many cases, these assumptions are not met. So in these cases, we're relying on generalized linear models. And the expected value is some function of this combination of parameters. So this is just another way of looking at what we just saw. You can, instead of define, you can define the inverse of a function instead of the function, which is basically the same, the same thing. And then you have your, your link function. Okay, let's look at the data. Yes. <laughs> so if you guys wanna, I don't know what's the best way to do this. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's clear, but uh, what I would like to comment is that um, depending on your data, you cannot use a uh, normal distribution because uh, normal says that you have a continuous, uh, continuous variation between minus infinity and plus infinity. So when you have uh, a biological, biological data, normally they don't have negative values. So mm -hmm. we need to restrict that, uh, that distribution to be positive. So that's when we would use a link function that makes the, the values only positive because you cannot accept negative values. And when you have a binomial, a binary data, you don't have negative values and you don't have values greater than one. So you use a log it function to make it restricted between zero and one. And um, that's uh, one thing. And then when you have a uh, count data, you cannot have negative counts. Yes. So you use a log function that restricts the values that are positive, but you do not have a uh, maximum value. So it is exponential. It, it starts at zero and goes to plus infinity. So that helped me understand a bit what, it, what a link function does depending on the type of data you have. Yes. So, uh, because biological, biological information main, uh, are not negative, uh, sometimes it can be, but <laughs> most of them are not. So the Gaussian distribution is not um, always the best one to, to model biological data. But if you, have a, if you have a normal distribution that is uh, way above zero, then it is hard to get negative values predicted by this model. So you can approximate the by by a normal distribution 
and you won't predict negative values. That that's what I understand. Yeah, but even even if I agree with you that very rarely biological data has negative values. But also the idea is do you believe that your y variable follows a normal distribution? And then for so for any normal distribution, the two parameters that you have is like your mean and like your variance, right? So even if you're very far away from zero or any negative values, like this could go like this, it might still be okay or like it's reasonable to use a normal distribution because your variable, your response variable is following a normal distribution even if it can't assume negative values. Does that make sense? I think it does. Well, I, I, I remember the example um, weight by height. Yes. Uh, the, po the, the values were always positive, but when you, you were trying to, when he tried to model with the Bayesian, uh, Bayesian model, it was uh, predicting negative values, and, but it was normal. It, it was a normal distribution around the mean, so the problem was the estimate and not the uh, the data. The data, uh, the normal distribu the normal distribution of the data was there. I think it's also important to think like, what do you want? What is the purpose of your model? Is it like inference? Is it prediction? There is another classical example where. They, like these authors, they have the data for how fast men and women are running the 100 meters in the Olympics. I don't know if you've seen this. So they have like, I don't know, I think the data starts in like 1925 or something. And then they have, so they have like the females, they, like the women, they're like this, and then men are, Yeah, like this, something like this, yeah. Let's see. And then here is like the time, and here is like the time to run 100 meters in seconds or something. And this is like, and this is for the blue is women and the yellow is men. Let's. And this paper is actually in Nature. So what they were looking at and what they were discussing is that the time, like what we can see from this data, is that the time that they're taking to run 100 meters is decreasing, but what they were comparing was the slope between men and women, and the slope between women was steeper than the one in men, which means that we're reducing our time faster than men, even though we run slower than men. So what they were asking is, so how long is it going to take for this curve to cross, which means that this is the time when women are going to run faster than men. And the expectation was something like, I don't know, 2,200, something like that. In the, yeah. But if you are going to do that, there's going to come a time where the time to, like, we're faster than the light. So it doesn't really make sense. So how much do you want to push your prediction? Because there's, like, other constraints in your system that, like, for which your predictions won't make sense, right? If I'm using for my response variable a variable that has a normal distribution, but then for my explanatory variables, they are not normally dis distributed, should I still use some sort of link function? No. no, that's okay. It's kind of the other examples that we had. So, like I said before, 
as long as the relationships that you have here are linear, this is fine. You can use generalized linear models. And it doesn't matter how your response variable here is your explanatory variable, sorry. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. It can be count data, it can be categorical variables. You're just using that to explain your why. You don't need to do any transformation in that data. What you wanna estimate is the importance of that variable in explaining your data, which is gonna be given by like your, your beta, your, your parameter beta. You, you can think about, for example, you might have a situation where you think that it's not, it's not the value of your explanatory variable itself that helps explain, but it's the log of it, or it's the square of it. Yes, that- It's still okay. That was also another question that I was going to ask. In the example of the Titanic, for example, we first had the estimates and then we plugged the, the co the coefficient, sorry. We had the coefficients, then we plug the coefficients in the, the function, right? Yes. To get the probability. Yes. What, which yes. was what we were looking for. Um, do I always have to do that? For example, if I'm modeling any variable for any other variable and I'm using some, for example, the, okay, it could be the, the lo logit function then I always have to run my model, then get the coefficients and, and plug them into the function? Not because what I'm, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, from what we discussed earlier from transforming data, so um, after you transform your data, the interpretation becomes... Morreu? No. <laughs> it becomes a little bit unclear, so... For example, if I'm using the logit function, I'm talking about how the logarithm of my predictors affect my variable, right? Yes. So... If you want to go back, which was like the case for your Poisson, and then if you want to go back, then you can exponentiate your... My coefficients. Yeah, your coefficients. Then I get like the then true you get effect. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And also when you're transforming your data, you're looking at the log of the weight, then your inferences are being made at the log scale. Yes. So if you want to go, like, it's, it's trickier to go back in that case because you transformed your data before fitting your model. Mm -hmm. So you're making inferences and predictions on the scale that you did your transformation. But when you're doing the parameters, you can bring them back and then make inferences when you exponentiate here, for example. And I think that there's, there's a function in R that does that for you. So you don't, you don't have to do this, but I need to see which one it is. But I know there's like. The repeating package has a logit and inverse logit function. So it's called logit or the link and inverse logit. Eu Mas eu tenho uma, per que, uma eu pergunta tá sobre ainda, né? é, as Pode categóricas. Well, you, you said that we can model uh, categorical response variables, mm -hmm. and I and I want to understand how that's possible. I think we have to make it like a discrete variable or a binary variable to to include it in the model. Wait. Okay, sorry, can you say it again? You have the categorical variables. 
So you you would have like you would have. Can you think of an example? Uh, how can I use categorical variables as response? You know. In the response variable. Oh, uh, so what is the probability distribution that you use for categorical variables? Y is yeah, it, is when, it? when I have, uh, uh, when we have uh, two cat categories, we can use binary data, zero and one. Yeah. That, that was, uh, he was talking about. regression may be log uh, multi uh, nominal logistic regression in this case uh, will be uh, logistic regression uh, multinomial exist uh, we have two kinds of logistic regression we have the logistic regression uh, binomial in this case bivaria in this case, we have two, the outcome have two categories. And the case that the outcome have more than two categories, more than two factors, we use uh, the model called logistic regression multinomial. Okay. It's the same thing with what we, we have seen, but the difference is the, the link uh, function. So the, the first one uh, in the B Variate case is a binomial in the other case that will be the log, the log link. I hope. It's there, but I don't think it's the. It's up. Yeah. Yeah, it's up. It's up. It's up. But it's incomplete. Really? 
Yeah, there's a, I sent you guys a longer one in the email because I couldn't, there's something with my Git. So it's just the, uh, the updated RMD. Yeah. You might need to install uh, Tidyverse if you don't have it yet, and for cats. So,
before you start running the the code, some for some people, this. UB, UCB admissions doesn't show. If you just call the library tidyverse, then you run this, this is gonna work. Yeah, just tidyverse. 